I'm so glad to see that you guys are here this morning, and uh, I trust that the Lord has a special delight for you as we go through the book of 2 John. Uh, John being the author of five books in the New Testament, as you might be aware. Um, I mean, you did, didn't know that he, he wrote five books. Yeah. There's the book of John. There's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then there's the book of Revelation. So all of them attributed to John. So. Uh, before we get started, let's just pray and ask the Lord to be with our hearts and minds. Lord, what a tremendous honor and a privilege it is to come before you today. The opportunity to meet as your body and each individual members of it. For us to come to worship you with our hearts and our minds and our words, our voices. Lord, what a privilege it is, what an honor it is to come before you and to have fellowship with your people, because of your spirit, because of your son, because of the work that you've done in us. Lord, we come to your word as your sheep, those who seek to be fed, those who need spiritual encouragement, some of us need correction, some of us need training in righteousness. And Lord, your word does all of that. So I pray that you would help us, that as your spirit speaks to our hearts and brings things to our mind, that we would be responsive, that we would be able to be your people truly, indeed, in all that we do and all that we say, that you might purify us by your word. So, Lord, we seek for you to wash us this morning. We dedicate this time to you, and we pray that we might become more like you in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in the book of Second John because it follows First John. And because 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were pretty much all written at the same time, they probably were given to the same messenger, although they have three different recipients. 1st John was written basically to the church. It's a straight out epistle. It's a letter to the church. 2nd and 3rd John have a very specific audience and individuals specifically. So we'll look at that as we look at the scriptures and I'll try to uh, confuse you a little bit as we go. You all look comforted by that. The truth and love, how important it is to balance those two things. Uh, and we'll, we're going to talk about that as we get into the scripture. But beginning here in verse 1 of 2 John. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in the truth as we receive commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So it's a straightforward letter. It's not necessarily an epistle. It's not a sermon. And it's just this one chapter, the 13 verses. 
Uh, chapter, you're going to see in 3rd John, he writes to a guy named Gaius. And so that has a very specific person. And this letter, too, also has a very specific person that it's written to. And it makes sense that they would be bundled together and sent with the same messenger to the same place. So as we do that, let's uh, all scratch our heads together. The elder, the elder is John. He always refers to himself as the elder, and there's no question of he being the one who writes this. Uh, even in his own epistle in, in John, rather, the uh, gospel, he doesn't refer to himself by name. He always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's an act of humility, not mentioning your own name, uh, dropping your own name all the time. So John just doesn't do that. And he calls himself the elder. Uh, so this is the, this is the old man, the presbyteros. So he's, he's called himself the old man, and he's in his 90s at this point, so he can call himself that. He calls himself the elder because there is no retirement from ministry. He's always in ministry. God's called him to be that, and even into his old age. And I think the scripture is very clear. There's no retirement for me. <laughs> There's no retirement for me. I, I won't be retiring uh, until I die. Uh, I hope it happens here. But uh, I, re retirement for a lot of people is to cease from work, is to cease from uh, doing anything productive, is to cease from being involved in anybody else and to just sit home and watch TV. Grow fat and, and, and have doctor bills and take lots of pills. Uh, you know, it's just... That is no, no life, just waiting to die, just, oh, another day. But see, John is active in ministry, and he was even sent to the island of Patmos where he wrote Revelation, as you know. And then he retires, actually, in Ephesus. Uh, do you remember his special job that he was given at the cross when Jesus died? To take care of Mary. Now, it's interesting because in that family, there were four boys. Mary had other children in addition to Jesus himself and two sisters Jesus had, two half-sisters, I should be correct. So he could have handed him off to someone, handed her off with the care of his mother to someone else, but handed her to John. Very interesting. Hands her to John. And so as we see the scripture, it says, to the elect lady and her children... Uh, most of the commentators that you look at will attribute this to the church. He's writing to the church. And yet, he's sending this together with a bundle along with 1 John, which is very clearly to the church. It seems very specific to mention the elect lady. Sometimes the Bible uses references like this to a church, like the virgin or the bride. And the scriptures are very clear about using that euphemism. But not the elect lady, which is rather interesting. Who would you think that elect lady might be? It might be he's writing to Mary. It's just the thought. You might want to consider it. And as we look through, in fact, you saw the, in, the, in the ending there, he says, and your sister and her children greet you, which could be a reference to a sister church, or it could be a reference to actual Mary's, Mary's sister, who she did have. So it's an interesting thing to understand who it's written to. And then as we go through the letter, you're going to see some things make more sense when it's written to an individual, like 3 John is written to an individual. And this says to the elect lady. Um, not many commentators you'll find will go to that extent, but it very well could be. And there are some very specific things that are written, I believe, to her as the elect lady, which would be very pertinent and very important, and we'll get into that as we open up the letter. But just to open up your mind a little bit, it may not be another letter to the church because certainly it, it has all of the earmarks of being a very personal letter. Just a, just a thought. And since Mary was the one that he personally was to take care of, it would make sense that he would write her a personal correspondence. So just something for us to think about. To the elder, to the elect lady, very well could be the church or it could be Mary herself, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. He then broaches into this subject of truth, which is very, very important, especially in the Christian faith. If you remember, Pilate and Jesus had a conversation about truth. When the Jews were trying to have him crucified because he claimed to be the son of God, essentially, and they caught that to be blaspheme because they saw him as merely a man and no more than that, they had this conversation about truth. In John 18, verses 37 to 38, 
Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Because there were people saying he claims to be the king of the Jews. And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and he said to them, I find no fault with him at all. And he washes his hands before them and he's trying to get Jesus off of this, you know, assassination which, which is going to occur. But Jesus explains to him that he is a king, but his kingdom is not of this earth. And if it was, his disciples would come and fight for him because his kingdom isn't of this earth. And when he explained all that to Pilate, Pilate didn't have a problem with it. I don't know about you, but if, if you're standing before some other official who's concerned about maintaining his authority, and you tell him that you supersede his authority, that could be intimidating. And yet there was a sense in which Pilate believed him, but not enough to do anything. And I think there are a lot of people who believe in Jesus as a historical figure, as a good teacher, as an enlightened master, they would say, but they don't accept him as who he said he is, the son of God, the very, very God, the son. So that he calls himself the truth and anyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus is, you know, in John's writings, especially in the gospel, he calls him the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory. His glory is the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he uses this word logos, this word, word, to describe Jesus. And in this passage, he's talking about Jesus as well. He's saying, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also those who have known the truth. Uh, he's, he's using it in interchangeable with Jesus, and I think it's uh, not a stretch to understand that. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. He doesn't say, I'm a truth. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So for us to read that and kind of substitute Jesus' name in there is not a stretch because he says, whom I love in Jesus, and not only I, but all those who have known Jesus, because Jesus, which abides in us and will be with us forever, because the Holy Spirit of God has come and taken up residence in our body, certainly is part of Christ. He sets this whole thing up about truth, and you'll see there are three times he mentions truth. He mentions it four times in the first three verses, so it's very important. In Colossians 2.8, it says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world and not according to Christ. You have to understand that not only God is at work in this world, but the, we also have an enemy. And he has people who work for him. And there are those who would seek to come in and subvert the deity of Jesus Christ and they would contaminate your mind and your heart and the way that you see things with human philosophies. Can any of you think of any? Not at this moment. Okay. That was the audience participation portion. That's all right. <laughs> if you turn on the TV, you will see all sorts of political things, racial things, economic things. You will find all sorts of things where people are trying to press you into a mold. In fact, Everywhere in this country, they're, tearing, they're changing names of towns and states. They're trying to tear down statues of people, renaming of forts. All of this is a reaction to everybody screaming and yelling, and it's truly the squeaky wheel gets the oil. It's a very interesting thing that everything's been fine up to this point. Now everything needs to change, and everyone seems to be getting on the boat. And it doesn't matter whatever thing it is that people scream and yell about, I can tell you the answer is found in Christ. It is not found in any other thing. You can, you can erect statues and call anything, anything you want to call it. You can call it by a pagan deity. You know, this is Sunday. You know why it's called Sunday? It was named after a pagan deity. Do I have a problem with that? Not at all. I'm here. 
Saturday. Do I have a problem with the day of Saturday? No, I enjoy Saturday. I love Saturday. Just because it's named after a pagan deity? No, I don't have a problem with that. What about Monday? You know, that's named after a pagan deity. I say we change the names of every day. Listen, call it whatever you want. It, it, it's going to be whatever it is because I make it so, not because they label it so. So don't, don't let the world try to press you into a particular mentality or a particular way. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy world. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm reacting. Forgive me. I'm going to go back to teaching. Truth. We're, we're, we're told to, but here's the interesting thing. You can go to college and ask that question, what is truth, and you'll never get a straight answer. Luckily, I went to a Bible college, and they taught it from a Christian point of view. Truth, there, there's a certain set of things that truth has to possess. If it doesn't, it's not true, right? Uh, the logic is, if A is true and B is false, A and B cannot be true together. And truth is exclusive, is it not? Do you stop at a red light or you don't stop at a red light? A red light means stop, right? It doesn't mean blow through at high speeds. It doesn't mean, you know, slow down and look before proceeding forward. It means stop means stop. I'm, somebody knows. I'm glad. That's good. Well, we live in Jersey. But see, that's part of the philosophy of the world that can contaminate us if we don't understand that there is a right and a wrong. And the world will tell you there's no right and wrong. Wrong is right. Right is wrong. Up is down. Down is up. Evil is good and good is evil. It's the end times, folks. That's just the way it is. So truth possesses coherence. In other words, it sticks together and it, and it works with itself. You'll notice the 66 books of the scripture, although written over such a long period of time and so many different authors, all cohere. They all stick together. They don't conflict. The truth possesses coherence and correspondence. In other words, it is whatever statement of truth it is that you make, it corresponds to the thing that it, des that it describes accurately. And so you have to have correspondence. Anyway, I'm, I don't want to get into a philosophy course. Truth possesses coherence and correspondence is objective. In other words, it doesn't, it, it's not true for me and not true for you. You know, like, uh, you know, beating your wife is okay for me, but not for you. You should never do that because you're married to my sister. But if I do it, you know, well, she deserves it. That is not truth, you see. That's hypocrisy, right? Just nod your head, because that's, that's the most heinous thing I could think of. It is objective. It is absolute. It is not subjective or relative. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how sincere you feel about a certain thing. If it's not true, it's not true. Just because you believe it's strong enough doesn't make it true, right? If I, if I believe stop signs are... Uh, an instrument of Satan to uh, get me to, to fall under the submission of his evil powers. I can believe that sincerely with all my heart. It doesn't change the fact that I'm wrong. So there are lots of sincere people that don't understand the truth. And so truth has to have a set of things. Before you absorb something, before you intellectually recognize something or adapt it into your life, make sure that it's true. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of news out there. You guys watch the news? Yeah, you watch the news? There's a lot of news out there, and not all of it comes from a true perspective. People are trying to sell you something. Just know that and filter it anytime you do that. The scriptures I don't have to worry about, and I would hope you people I don't have to worry about, but everything has to go through the filter of what is true, and I have to have it get through that so I can do what's right. Verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So now he's adding love to the mix as he introduces. Uh, usually people will be either very truthful or very loving. Have you found this to be the case? In, in my particular family, my wife was the very loving one, and I was the very truthful one. My children loved my wife. My children feared me. That's just the way it worked. As, as I grew in Christ and as I uh, were, was married longer, I understood that this love that she possessed was actually the heart of God and the image of God imprinted upon her. And I've learned from her, and I believe it or not, I am much more loving today than I've ever been. This is it. So far. 
And my wife did not want to say things to people because she didn't want to hurt their feelings. How many of you are like that, I wonder? You don't want to say, OK. How many people enjoy saying things to people that are truthful, just to be brutally honest? Um, Andrew, I knew it. You see, some people that are brutally honest are just brutal. You know, It's not about being honest. It's just they enjoy the torture. But, you tend to fall on one side or the other. Either you're very truthful and honest and you tend to be analytical and, and all of that, or you're very loving and you're considerate and you're thoughtful of the, the feelings of other people and how your words might affect them and uh, you try to avoid conflict and all of that. Or you're a person that says, this should not go on because this is not true. Do, do you find that to be the case? I find that to be the case on both sides. So I, I realize that my shallow end of the pool is love and so the Lord had to deepen me in that end to be more loving and considerate and thoughtful and sometimes confrontational towards people in a loving fashion instead of just being brutally honest. Uh, it's being honest in a loving fashion. So speaking the truth in love is very, very important. In Ephesians 4.15 it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up all things into him who is the head, who is Christ. So if, if we're hoping for growth in Christ, which all of, we, all of us are, I'm sure, we need to speak the truth in love. We can't just love people and say, man, I care about you and, and uh, I have your best interest at my heart and so I'm not going to tell you the truth. I'm going to let you walk around with that booger on your face and, you know, because I don't want to hurt your feelings, you know, so I'll just let you do that. Do you understand now that's not very loving at all? It certainly isn't true, right? So. Speaking the truth in love, that's the perfect balance. And people will accept the truth very often if it's loving, and it's very hard to accept the truth if it's not. You guys know what it's like when somebody gives you the truth like in your face and they're not very loving about it? I'm, I've been guilty of such things. Here's some things. Uh, we have truth decay in our society. You may have noticed that. Uh, not something you need to see your dentist about. It's something maybe you should just turn the TV off for. Uh, but truth decay. Truth is not valued. In fact, most colleges teach that there is no truth, that there's no absolute truth. There's nothing that you can say that's true, although that very statement is absolute truth. Absolutely. So here, I'm sorry, I'm getting into philosophy. Here, here's the deal. Increasing disagreement about facts and analytical interpretations of facts and data. You see that? That's because there's a truth decay, because people can't agree on what's true anymore. Truth has been completely clouded. A blurring of the line between opinion and fact. You know, most of the shows that you see that are supposed to be news shows are much more there for your entertainment. They have famous people on there that they interview and get their political opinion. That's not fact. That's somebody's opinion. An interview is somebody's opinion. It's not gathering facts. The increasing relative volume of resulting influence of opinion and personal experience over fact. It's not about finding the facts. It's finding the people who are giving you the facts that back up what you think already. And there's not a commitment to understanding what is true anymore. In fact, journalism is probably the most contaminated industry with this. And declining trust in formally respected sources of facts. It used to be that you could believe what was coming out of Washington. You could believe what was coming over the news, you know, with Walter Cronkite. You know, you could believe that these are Dan Rather. You know, you could believe these people because they were careful to vet their information and give it to you. But now it's such a competitive thing that people want to get it out there because it's a consumer-driven society where if I give you murder, death, and rape, and disgust, and if I give you that, that's what's going to make you addicted to the TV. Thank God for the COVID virus. That kept everybody glued to the TV, glued to the radio. What's the news? What's going on? What's happening? Hurricanes? Weathermen love hurricanes because they get much more face time on TV. You know, disasters and natural disasters. Isn't that weird that something like that would become such a point of uh, self-aggrandizement as opposed to communicating truth? So truth has decayed because it's much more important about how you feel there are people that think with their eyes and they feel with their ears. There's no more rationalizing. There's no more checking. We just accept things. And the scriptures are very careful to say, be careful because truth and love are hugely important. And if you're not careful, you could swallow something false and not know it. So what it is 
I greatly rejoice that I have found some of your, some of your children walking in the truth. Now, if we're talking about Mary, we know that some of her children were walking in the truth, at least two that have written some scriptures. One was James. The book of James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, and the book of Jude, which is uh, following 3 John. So those two were the half-brothers of Jesus. They were children of Mary who wrote scriptures. So he says, I'm, I'm pleased to find that some of your children are walking in the truth as we receive commandment from the Father. And so John himself, as the author of those five books, mentions truth 38 times. So it's hugely important as he communicates to us. Truth and love are needed to be balanced, as I've said. Truth without love is brutality. If you just speak the truth and it's not intended with love, it's going to come across like a slap in the face. Just because you got a fly in your face doesn't mean I should slap you as hard as I can, right? That, unfortunately, is what happens when you speak the truth and it doesn't have love or it has very little love. And then love without truth is hypocrisy. If I say, I love you, I love you, and I care about you, but I can't tell you this difficult thing, so I'm just going to not say anything. It's not only destructive for you because you have to bear this secret and not tell somebody, but it's also destructive that someone else doesn't have the information to make a right decision, right? Okay. I'll move slower. No, I'm just kidding. I'll move faster. So I'm not sure sometimes when people are being brutally honest or they're just being mean. Because uh, you, you can certainly do that. Walking in the truth means to be not lying, right? If you're walking in the truth, you're not lying. Do you know why people lie? Do you know why you lie? Give me five reasons why you lie. No, I'm just... I should call people up. No, I just won't do that. I, I looked on the internet and it told me all I need to do about lighting uh, from, from Pinocchio. But here's some reasons why people might lie. I pulled this off the internet, so it's got to be true. They don't want to hurt you. People have a big heart and they're really concerned and they really care about you and they're concerned about your emotions. They're more concerned about theirs usually underneath it all. But they don't want to hurt you. Number two, they don't want to look bad. You know, they don't want to be the one giving you the bad news, and then they look bad, and they're always remembered as the people who are giving you the bad news. They want, they want their lie to be true. This is a little more complicated. Like when it says, somebody came in this morning and said, hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm unbelievably good. I am blessed above the best. I'm, you know, people say things because they wish them to be more than they truly are sometimes. And so sometimes people are lying, although it doesn't come in the form of a lie. Like somebody says, hey, how you doing? I'm good. Do you really mean that? No, I don't mean that. Okay, you lied to me. <laughs> you want to be good, but you're not good. Okay, now we can have a conversation. But see, because people aren't being honest, you don't get to the root of it. They fear being judged. People don't tell the truth because they fear being judged. I don't want you to judge me. If I tell you the truth about my past and what a horrible, terrible human being I am, especially being up here on the stage, you might never trust a thing I say. Or maybe you will say, that guy should not be a pastor. And so maybe I shouldn't say it. So maybe I don't tell you the truth because I'm afraid to be judged. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Now, certainly you don't want to hang your dirty laundry out for everyone, but you should have a small circle of people that you do tell everything to. Or, or nearly everything, as God leads you. Fear of being judged. Intimacy, defense, mechanism. In other words, the more I tell the truth and the more you know about me, anything I say can and will be used against me. And so I don't want to be in, intimate with you. I don't want to have a deep conversation with you. I don't even want to know you, and I don't want you to know anything about me. So what I do is I keep to myself, and so I just don't tell you anything. Uh, so it's an intimacy defense mechanism. Or if I tell you a lie, it kind of puts you away so we don't get tight. They don't trust you. Sometimes people don't tell you the truth because they don't trust you. They don't trust what you're going to do with that truth. They don't trust that you're going to keep it a secret. They don't trust that you're not going to go blab it everywhere. So I can't tell you something because, oh my goodness, I know everyone will know in an hour. Sometimes that's why people lie. They're afraid that you won't understand. If I explain something of a sensitive nature of my life or what I'm struggling with, if I'm involved in a sin uh, or if I'm in, in a besetting sin, I, I can't tell you because I don't know how you're going to react. I, 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 I don't know that I can trust you. I'm afraid that you won't understand. It's all a test. Some people, 
I understand, I, I got this off a website which is talking about women dating men and why women lie to men specifically. They sometimes throw lies just to see the reaction. I know not you good people. But there are people who make up lies and throw it at people just to see how they react. So it's a bit of a test. You could be a pro manipulator and be somebody who lies. Lying can be because you just like to manipulate people and so you have grown accustomed to doing that, either learning it or understanding it as a survival mechanism in your upbringing. And so what you do is you manipulate people with lies. So that's why people lie. Sometimes people want to hold the power and they feel that by controlling the narrative they have the power. Although it's a lie, so you don't really have any power, it's only imagined. And that there's no moral concept of truth. There are people that lie because they don't understand, number one, God sees everything and knows the truth. And number two, you have to tell 20 other lies to cover up that one lie. Don't you understand the moral implications of not telling the truth? Not only before God, but also being caught by other people. Because you know what happens when you're caught by other people lying? They don't trust you. I can't trust you anymore. Talk to Tiger Woods. His wife couldn't trust him anymore. He cheated on his wife multiple times and confessed it. It's all out in the open. It's not a secret. I'm not gossiping. His wife couldn't trust him. So that was the end of that. In fact, a lot of divorce ends in just that way. Their trust has been undermined. In fact, the scripture gives that as one of the reasons that divorce is accepted, actually. It's the only reason Jesus says that it's acceptable, it's, it's permissible, it's not necessary, is if there's infidelity, sexual infidelity. Because you have broken your marriage vows, and how can somebody trust you again? How do you get on the road to healing? It's difficult. It's not impossible, but it certainly is difficult. So all these reasons that people would lie, right? Liar, liar. Pants on fire, or pantsuit on fire, um, <laughs> depending on who you are. And he says, verse 5, now I plead with you, lady. Notice he's mentioning lady again, which is a, a, a feminine pronoun. So uh, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have heard from the beginning, we, that we love one another. Now, we've heard this in 1 John, so I don't, won't belabor this. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments, and his commandment that we have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. This is his commandment, that we should love one another. In fact, that's the biggest thing. It goes all the way back to Leviticus, back to the writings of Moses in Leviticus 19, 15, 18. Uh, here's, here's some information. He's going to give you some very specifics, and then he's going to give you the general at the bottom. So here we go. You shall do no in, injustice in judgment. By the way, we call that prejudice. You shall do no injustice in judgment. In other words, you don't make judgments on half-truths, partial truths, or having no information whatsoever and just judging by appearance. You shall not be partial to the poor. In other words, uh, be advantageous and take things from them, nor honor a person of the mighty. In other words, you don't treat them differently because of what, how much money they have. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. In other words, not because, you know, he's got a better look of property than you, so you're going you're gonna to give it to him. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. That's a gossip. Nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. In other words, bear a grudge. I am the Lord. Notice why. Because God sees and God knows and he'll undertake. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. That seems pretty simple, right? How many of you have trouble with bitterness? Yes. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor. In other words, you don't keep it a secret when you've got a problem with somebody. Did you know that the scripture said that you need to confront people, all you loving people? You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. When you're bitter at somebody else and you don't deal with it or you don't go talk to somebody, you are bearing sin. That's what the scripture says. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So that's actually where it comes from. Usually you hear, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. You don't hear all that other stuff. But isn't it interesting? The Old Testament, who would have thought? 
Leviticus is full of information, and the scriptures are the foundation which this nation was founded. The laws which are found in the scriptures are very much applied in this nation uniquely. And I think that's why God has shown grace to our nation so far. So we'll have to see where that goes. Love, of course, to remind you of, of what we've been discussing, this definition is the unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another. It's not necessarily um, wishing that their feelings never get hurt or having an, an admiration or a, an affection for. Love is an action. It's not an emotion. It has nothing to do with hearts and Cupid and arrows and chocolates. It has nothing to do with any of that. It is the unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another, and very often the good of another over yourself. Romans 12, 10, I, I like uh, this particular version, the Holman version, says, show family affection to one another with brotherly love and outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. So here's, here's the question. If there was an Olympic event and loving, not, not what the world has called it, but what it truly is, was an Olympic event, who would get the gold medal? Right? It should be you. It should be you. You should get the gold medal. Because the scripture says that you should outdo one another. You know, people go through an incredible amount of training in their diet. And I mean, they spend years and they, they run every day and they do all these things to get the Olympics, to be the best, to show that they're the fastest. They could jump the highest. They could run the furthest, right? And they all seek to win. There's nobody there that, that's looking to just show up. They're all looking to win. And the scripture says that we should seek to outdo one another in acts of loving kindness towards one another. Can you imagine if we actually all did this? You guys should all get a gold medal. We're going to call it the Christian Olympics. That's what church is. I think that's what the scripture says. That's what church is. Church is a place where you all seek unselfishly for the good of another person to be benevolent and to be loving towards them. So, let's see if we can all practice that today. Can any of you think what I need right now? No, no, I'm good. I don't know. I'm good. <laughs> Verse 7. For many deceivers, this is where they get into the caution. Uh, there was this wonderful greeting and there was this, uh, this thing about love. And now there's going to be a caution to this lady. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, and they do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Now, can you imagine if this letter was to Mary, how important that would be? She was the one who bore Jesus. She knows he was in the flesh. The Gnostics were trying to say Jesus wasn't a real person. He wasn't a real human being. He kind of floated up off the ground, you know, and didn't even have to walk, and he didn't leave footprints and all of that. The Gnostics were into this thing that Jesus was some kind of an astral projection. He wasn't real. And he's somewhat trying to unravel what the Gnostics were purporting. And there are other people that say Jesus was nothing more than a human being. So that would be the opposite of what the Gnostics were saying. So it, it was a confusing world back then, and it's no different today. You can find people that still believe this. Uh, they, they've gone out into the world, and they do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Antichrist is somebody that is a substitute for Christ. And look to yourselves, so he's talking about within the church, that you do not lose those things which we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Be careful that you don't have sheep that go astray and make sure that they don't get lost on the highway of information, essentially. If I could break it down into a contemporary Jersey version. Make sure that there are people that aren't being deceived by these people. And so that's why I talk about these things. I don't enjoy uh, lancing, you know, false prophets from up here, but it's something I think you need to be aware of. And uh, sometimes I name names. I won't be today. But, you know, you need to be a little bit of a watchdog. This guy's name is Spike, actually, because he has spikes all around his collar. He has spikes all around his collar because wolves will attack this dog 
and they will go right for the throat. And so it's an ingenious way if you have a, if you have a dog that handles sheep like that, um, that's how you handle it. You make sure that they, uh, they have spikes around their collar. But anyway, that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying you need to be on the watch for wolves because there are many that go out. He said this in 1 John too, right? So if you remember, there, there was this admonition towards the end to be careful about false wolves in sheep's clothing. In fact, uh, you, this is a whole bunch of sheep that have died as a result of a, a pack of wolves that came. And there are churches that get attacked by wolves, and uh, the carnage is terrible. It usually, he just picks them off one at a time, and then they go away, and they end up in despondency somewhere. But he's saying, keep your eyes open and look among yourselves and make sure this doesn't happen to you, because you're not going to ever lose your salvation, but you could lose your rewards. So he's saying, be careful, because you want a full reward. When you go before the Lord, you don't want to uh, you know, go, go with, with half a bucket. You want to have a full bucket. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. That's a pretty simple scripture. I'm sure none of you have it tattooed on your arm, but it's a very simple one. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. To transgress here, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine, it means to, to overstep or to avoid. It's the same sort of a word when the... the the man who was down on the road and Jesus told the parable of how the, the priest went and he went around the person who had fallen in the road, the Samaritan who was taken and, and, and left for dead. They kind of went around and they avoided him. That's the same word. That's the word transgress. It actually means to go around, to step over, uh, to avoid. Anyone who does that to the, the doctrine of who Jesus Christ truly is, that he is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God, they do not have God. If they don't accept Jesus for who he says he is, they don't have the Father. It's just that simple. Don't let the world tell you, well, all roads lead to God. Oprah will tell you that. Um, there'll be any number of people who tell you, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, even if it's not true. So you want to make sure that you don't accept these people and, and accept what they do. They'll pretend that they're on your team. They'll even use Jesus in a, in, a, in a sentence. They can tell you about Jesus, and some of them are very well-versed well in the Scripture, but they don't believe in the same Jesus that you believe in. They don't accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God. In 1 John 2, 5, and 6, uh, something close, he says, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he walked. So if you call yourself a Christian, you should be living like Jesus. You should be speaking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, thinking like Jesus, feeling like Jesus. Yes, all of those things, because a pupil always becomes like the teacher. It's just the way it is. And if God has truly imprinted a new heart upon you, you will be a, a new person. And those of us who claim to know Jesus Christ need to walk in the truth. If you're not walking in the truth, he says right here, if you don't abide, if you don't live in, if you haven't adopted this, then you, are, you don't know God. It's a, it's a fictitious thing. It's an imagination. It's whatever it is, but it's not real. Right? All right, good. As long as you got that. So the question is, are you under the influence? Because if you're under the influence and the Spirit of God lives in you, you're going to see it. Just like if somebody's drunk and they're under the influence, there's, there are ways of telling that somebody's under the influence, Right? If you say that you are in Christ, you will be under the influence of Jesus, which means you'll be abiding in this and understanding it, and you'll have truth revealed to you. It will show in your behavior and everything that you do, and the scripture is pretty clear about that. Galatians 5 tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Notice it's the first thing. Love should be coming out of our lives if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, and then obviously joy, peace, long-suffering, which means you suffer long, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, and they live in the Spirit. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So that is the life of a Christian. And if you've heard anything else, like you, you belong to a church, therefore you're a Christian, or you're part of a club that they call themselves Christians, 
and it has nothing to do with the way that you live your life or anything changed in your heart or your mind, then, then you don't know him. You just don't know him. And that, that would be a sad state for anybody that I would know to not understand very clearly who Jesus is from the scriptures. In verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him. Notice it says into your house. It's not talking about the church now. It's talking about a domicile. That's why it very well might be Mary that he's writing to. And of course, those of us who are not Catholic uh, or those of us who once were Catholic may have an aversion to that thought, but she was called blessed by angels. She was, a, she was a good woman and God picked her. So, but it doesn't mean she did, didn't need to be saved and she didn't need to accept Jesus as her savior because she certainly did. And it doesn't mean that she's on the same par with Jesus and anybody that tries to tell you she is is trying to sell you something. And boy, there's a whole world of information there. But anyway, do not receive them into your house or greet them. He who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Just like if you happen to be in a car and somebody in that car is possessing of an illegal substance and you get pulled over and that person gets found, you get charged just like you're them. It doesn't matter who's in the car. You, you get charged, so you want to be careful who you get in the car with. I've gotten in a car with people and then found out, I, I, I need to get out of here. So uh, you, you don't want to share in their evil deeds. Choice is selective and exclusive. There are people that you choose to spend time with and there are people you don't choose to spend time with. And the criteria is this. If they accept Jesus Christ for who he is, if they don't accept Jesus who he is, I don't have fellowship with you. I can't, I can't hang out with you, be friends with you, tell you intimate things because it, you don't know the Savior. You don't know him. And the thing is, if I, have, if I have somebody in my church, let's say they're a famous person but they don't know Jesus, you know, they're going to leave here and say, yeah, I go to church at Grace Bible Fellowship, and the whole world's going to look at them and say, what kind of people are they? If this person's living a sinful lifestyle, it's, it's definitely going to be a mark on the name of Jesus, but it'll also be a mark against Christ himself and the church. So don't accept them into your house. Church is very often met in homes. And can you imagine if this is Mary this is being written to, if somebody says, yeah, well, I was just with Mary the other day, had dinner over the house, and they could purport any doctrine at all, and people would believe it because they're tight with Jesus' mother. You see how that could be a problem? And you don't want to do that. So be careful that you don't spend time with people because you will partake in their evil deeds. You, you will then be responsible. There are ministries that people give to all the time that are found to be inerrant, or to be in error, rather, they share in that responsibility. If you've ever given loads of money to some preacher and found out that he's some kind of a dirty dog, you, you know what I'm talking about. It feels horrible to be part of that sort of deception. And it can very easily happen. So choice is selective and it is exclusive. In Jude chapter 1 verses 22 to 23 it says this, And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. In other words, we are to use judgment. Yeah, that's the word I used. We are to use judgment as to the people that we spend time with and how we react to them. Jesus slammed down the Pharisees because that's what they needed. Jesus spoke to the woman by the well because that's what she needed. Jesus told the rich young ruler, you got to let go of your stuff and give it all to God because that's what he needed. He told the lame man, get up and walk because that's what the, the lame man needed. And so you see, he treated each person in accordance with what their need was. He didn't treat everyone the same. He treated them in accordance to what their need is. By the way, that's the definition of love, isn't it? It's treating somebody in the way in which they should be treated. That's loving your neighbor as you love yourself. I tell people the truth pretty readily because I want to hear the truth. I find, it, I find it very difficult to love people. I'm getting better at it, but I find it very difficult to love people because perhaps I don't understand fully what that looks like. So understand that there are different ways of treating people and it's right for you to do, not based upon the color of someone's skin or how much money they have, obviously, but upon real criteria. It's not wrong just so that you know that. Luke 9, 4 to 5 says, 
whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there, depart. This is when he sent out the disciples to go uh, two by two and preach the gospel. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. You see, that what they would do is go and they would tap their, their shoes off as a testimony. I don't even want to bring the dirt from this town with me because it's contaminated because you wouldn't receive the message. And that's a testimony against them. Listen, I, I don't want to take anything from your town. I have absolutely no interest in taking even the dust on the feet uh, of my shoes with me because you guys rejected the truth. So there are people that you will shut out. There are people that you should not spend time with. There are people that you should not enter into. You shouldn't even greet them. Isn't that interesting? There are people that are living in sin, deep in sin, and twisting the word of God. And those people I don't have fellowship with. And I'm not embarrassed to say that. We live in a world that's very ecumenical. And can't we all get along? And can't we all just agree on some stuff? And, you know, we're all the same. And we're all God's children. Listen, we're all God's creation. But we're not all God's children. So I'm not going to put myself in the vat with all these people and just mix it up. I'm going to stick to what the scripture tells me to do. And it says there are certain people you shouldn't have anything to do with. We all clear on that? You good loving people? Okay, good. Because as you're talking about love, you can take this the wrong way and say, I need to love everybody. I need to love them you know, to excess. But there are certain people you don't. And the right thing for you to do is to cut them off. You know, if... If, if, if your kid is staying home and, and because they're lazy and they're not going to work and they're not launching, it's not necessarily their fault. It might be your fault. I'm just saying. I kicked my kids out pretty quick, so I can say that with, with all truth and probably light on love. <laughs> Jude chapter 1 says this, uh, verses 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation... I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend, that means fight, earnestly for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice they're inextricably linked, Jesus Christ and God the Father. There are folks that will come in here and say, eh, don't worry about it. Don't be so fastidious. Don't be so law-keeping. Don't be so scripturally rooted. You could, you could do anything. God will forgive you. Isn't that why Jesus came after all? Eh, wrong. That's, that's, the wrong <laughs> that's the wrong thing to say. If Jesus died for your sin, why would you want to heap more of that onto Jesus? Why would you want Jesus' sacrifice to be bigger because you have more sin. Why would you do that? Wouldn't it produce a heart of thankfulness in you and a heart that says, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do? It's the way it should be. But there are people who have crept in and they have taken the grace of God and turned it into lewdness. Well, you can just do whatever you want to do. It's okay. Jesus will forgive you. It's okay. It's not okay because you bear the side effects of that sin. And there's, there are rewards that are lost. So anything of value is worth fighting for and protecting. Amen? If it's worth fighting for, it, it's because it's valuable. And the scriptures certainly are that. And Titus 3, 10 to 11 says, Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. So somebody who's divisive. You know, somebody that when you say something, they say, oh, I don't think that's true. They say, oh, well, this, well, I don't think that's completely right either. You know, no matter what you say, they seem to have a comment that's to the contrary. Or a person that's divisive, they're trying to divide the body of Christ. So they come up to you and they say, you know what so-and-so said about you? I can't believe they said this. I mean, I'm just telling you. Because that's divisive. You're trying, to, you're trying to divide people. You warn this person after a first and a second admonition. You go to them once and then you go to them a second time. And then have nothing to do with them. Really? Yeah. If you warn them once and then you warn them a second time, have nothing to do with them. Not only are they sinning and they're at their core, they're in, they, they have a problem, but they're self-condemned. They, in their own heart, know that they're wrong. But they're so busy fighting, they won't listen. You may, you may have been a person like this at some point. 
I, I, I know I was. I have to be careful it doesn't rise up and form a root in my heart again. But here's the thing. You tell somebody who's divisive, you warn them once, you warn them a second time, and then they're done. You cut them off. That seems harsh in a world that encourages universal love of everyone no matter what they do, and they believe that's what the church teaches. That's not what the church teaches. Because you have to insulate and save yourself because they will contaminate you, and you will have to bear the responsibility for their sin by doing nothing. Make sense? Okay. So love and truth need to be carefully balanced. If, if it's all truth and no love, it's brutality. If it's all love and no truth, it's hypocrisy. Good, I was kind of hoping you'd get that. Good. Verse 12. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink. I hope to come to you and speak to you face to face that our joy may be full. You see, that's another indication that it's an individual because he's talking about coming and talking to them face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. By the way, did you know Mary had a sister? She was uh, married to Cleopas, actually. So a uh, little research for that. But anyway, the children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So he says, I'm, I'm hoping to come to you and, and do a face-to-face -face because you guys know face-to-face -face is always better than texting, right? Amen. Because texting, people can get the wrong idea of what you're saying. Amen. You ever send a text and somebody get all offended and you're like, thank God there are emoticons. You can put a, a smiley face and that changes everything, right? You can say, what are you talking about? And put a smile. Or you can say, what are you talking about? And it just sounds sarcastic. Everything I write to everyone sounds sarcastic. <laughs> and I think that's my fault. So I always put an emoticon, you know, a thumbs up or smile or just so that you know. Or if I say something that's a joke and I don't really believe it, I'll put one of them crazy faces, the, the eyes all googly and all. It's important that you do that because sometimes the force of what you say can be misinterpreted. And John says, listen, I, I, wanted to, I didn't want to just put this all down in paper. I wanted to come and greet you personally so that we might talk face to face and, and kind of iron these things out. But he says, be careful who you let in your house. Be loving, hold fast to the truth, but be careful of who you let in your house because they can cause a lot of destruction. Uh, I've had a lot of people live with us at some point in time, and I can tell you some of them have been very, very good. Some of them we've been able to minister, and some of them have caused an incredible rift in our home. So be careful who you let in your house because can you imagine somebody living in Pastor Dave's house and they come to you with some doctrine that they say they heard from me? Don't believe it. Check with me first. Anyway, and he says, your elect sister, the children of your elect sister greet you. And uh, it, it very well could be a sister church or it could be the sister of Mary who also had children who were in ministry with him. So uh, that is the book of 2 John. It's a rather short book. And it's very much like 1 John, so I didn't elaborate on a lot of the points. Uh, but the, basically is we need to be people that are 100% truthful, not lying for convenience or to save face or any other thing. We need to be people that are honest and truthful and loving, both at the same time. And if we lack in one of those, knowing your lack will help you to know where God needs to grow you up. And the, the, and the other thing is I just... I pray that you guys would exercise these things and realize that there are people that you should draw near. I heard a pastor on the radio say, if you are the smartest person in your group, you need a new group. Because you're going to become like the people that you spend time with. And if you spend time with people that are, you know, morally devoid, what's going to happen is it's going to wear off on you. And you will have to bear the guilt of their sin. So... If I don't tell my son to straighten up, get his act together, and he ends up in jail, I'm going to feel embarrassed because I didn't do all that I could. I didn't speak the whole truth, and I may not have spoken it entirely lovingly. And so I have to bear that. I'm talking about me here, not any one of you. And I just, I praise God for the scriptures because they always point us in the right direction. I pray that God would help you guys to speak the truth in love today. In Jesus' name.